Well, we're going to discuss Ireland's blasphemy laws now with David Quinn and Michael Nugent. And the reason we're doing so is, as I mentioned earlier in the programme, something of a surprise perhaps that the cartoons that were published uh, by Charlie Hebdo, that they weren't reproduced on the front pages of today's Irish or indeed uh, British newspapers when you might have thought that a point could have been made to the terrorists that they would not be able to silence uh, those who put such cartoons into the public domain. Michael Nugent from Atheist Ireland, what's your understanding of the Irish law as it stands at present? Well, everybody claims to be opposed to the blasphemy law, all the political parties, uh, whether in power or out of power, and yet it's still there. It's uh, being cited by Islamic states at the United Nations uh, in support of their blasphemy and uh, defamation of religion laws in countries where you can be murdered for blasphemy. Uh, You must know you're doing something wrong when Pakistan is citing you as best practice for blasphemy laws. And I I think there's absolutely no excuse for maintaining it. Uh, The the, uh, government, unfortunately, Unfortunately, having committed to holding a referendum recently, said through an anonymous spokesperson that it's unlikely that the referendum will take place in the lifetime of this government. David Quinn, columnist with the Irish Independent and from the Own Institute. How do we get this blasphemy law in the first place? Well, I mean, it's in the Constitution and it was never made part of statute law. Um, it was introduced uh, in the last government shortly after the Danish cartoon controversy. That's when uh, this Danish magazine, like the one in France, published a cartoon of a Mohammed-like figure with a bomb-shaped turban on his head. And if you remember, there was riots in the Muslim world and there was people killed and Danish exports, which I think is the key thing, from our government's point of view, suffered greatly. So um, a government member at the time told me privately it was introduced so that we wouldn't get into a Dana-style situation where Irish exports to the Middle East got affected. So I think that's actually what prompted because, I mean, like the, uh, the, uh, the constitutional provision on blasphemy has been sitting there since the 1930s, but no statute though was introduced till what, six, seven years ago or thereabouts? So all those decades had passed and then suddenly it's introduced and the story as I have it is it was in response to the Danish cartoon controversy. We were scared about our exports. I, I, I think that's slightly... Um I think whoever told you that might be slightly uh, misinformed. Uh, there, there, there was a statute law from 1961. It was within the Defamation Act of 1961 that Charles O'Hee brought it in. And uh, the only time that it was tested, the courts found that it wasn't enforceable because the, the statute law didn't define what the offence consisted of. That was a, after a, a cartoon, after one of the divorce referendums. And then the Defamation Act itself was, was being uh, reviewed and it was assumed that most people, by most people, that the government would take the opportunity to get rid of the blasphemy law. But what happened was Dermot O'Hearn just suddenly seemed to go on a solo run at the very end and, and decided that this was the the most important constitutional thing to do was, was to define blasphemy. Some of those cartoons uh, from Charlie Hebdo, which I thought might have been published today, do you think that the Irish media decided not to do so on the basis of the blasphemy laws as they stand or do you think it was possibly for fear that they could make themselves target for retaliation? Well there's a saying from the, the, the old Wild West uh, it's, that's, that the final rule of poker is that a Smith & Wesson revolver beats four aces and I, I think one of the issues here is that people, whatever intellectual arguments that you can put up for either publishing or not publishing cartoons, the idea that some people are going to murder you concentrates the mind quite quite significantly and I think it's very important that people stand up to this it's, it's essentially the same as standing up to the IRA or loyalist paramilitaries people who are prepared to murder people in order to enforce their vi- vision of society and democracy have to be stood up to what do you make of that, David Quinn? Well, I agree, but, but like the interesting thing is, uh, uh, as you said, like the British papers didn't publish them either, and they don't have an anti-blasphemy law, and they still didn't publish them. Now, there's a third possibility as to why they didn't publish them. It, it mightn't have been fear. They might have decided that the cartoons are disrespectful of Muslims and their beliefs, therefore, out of respect, we won't publish them. There could have been that, for example. So, we do, like, it would have been interesting to go into the newsrooms of all the various newspapers yesterday and hear the discussions and find out why didn't they publish them. Was it fear? Because again, Britain it clearly wasn't because of the law. Was it fear or was it out of respect for Muslims? Let's hear a little bit of what Ali Salim said on this programme last night. If you want to put on your headphones there, uh, this is part of a general conversation that we had, but I did put to him the possibility that various newspapers today would publish these cartoons and what his reaction to that would have been. We have the right to enjoy it, but everything has limits. And I will be delighted to see these journalists who are planning to do this. Can they do that to the Holocaust? If they can, well, then let them do it to what the Muslims believe in. 
But that's sort of a what about sort of thing, you know, sort of, well, you can't do this to us because such and such can't be done to somebody no, else. No, that is only to prove that there are limits for your freedom of expression. Because so if you, you do exceed, believe in limits? Of, of the course there are limits, because if, if, if there is no limit, then it turns into aggression and transgression. And, 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 aggression? Basically, and basically the publication or the republication of these cartoons, let's ask one simple question, what common good does it achieve? But the aggression wasn't in the pens of the cartoonists, the aggression was in the Kalashnikovs of of the two men who went killing the cartoonists? Both both of them actually did a mistake, but one of them did a, a, a mistake and the other committed an atrocity. Limits on the freedom of expression, David Quinn, what do you make of that? Well, I mean, like, I'm in favour of repealing the blasphemy law and, uh, and you know, if and when there's a vote on the constitutional provision, I will vote in favour of repealing it. I've always been in favour of that. I mean, I'm, I don't believe... I mean, free speech has certain limits, OK? But I think, you know, it should have a, a, a extremely broad freedom. Um, see, who decides the limits? Well, you see... OK, uh, I mean, I was saying to your researcher, uh, take our anti-hate speech laws, all right? How expansive should they be? I see, you know, Minister for Equality, Aon O'Reardon, thinks they should be strengthened because there should be a threshold of decency, is what he's saying. So, I mean, the question comes back there, what should that limit be? Um, I think you should be allowed to say an awful lot, but I think there should be certain limits. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, incitement to hatred is a limit that we have anyway, all right? Um, already people are not allowed to incite hatred, and that is a limit on free speech. So, it, like in so many areas of law, it's simply a matter of getting the balance right, but as far as possible, you should err on the side of free speech, but there has to be certain limits. And kind of, I suppose, like what worries me somewhat about where things are going in this country, while there seems to be a general consensus in favour of repealing our blasphemy law, there is also a growing move to strengthen our anti-hate speech laws. So, like in the last few years, there was an attempt to have Kevin Myers prosecuted uh, for, uh, for hate speech. And uh, there was some moves against, some talk about Brenda Power. Uh, a couple of years ago... Uh, I think that was in relation to comments she made about travellers. Correct. Um, uh, in respect of um, a bishop in Donegal, Bishop Philip Boyce, he had given uh, a sermon in Knock in which he talked about the slings and arrows of a secular culture and a councillor in Kildare, I think, tried to have him charged with incitement to hatred. Now, none of these stuck, but supposing we strengthen so-called anti-hate laws to the point where um, these uh, attempts would stick, then we would have very severe limits placed on freedom of speech at the same time as removing the blasphemy law. In that spirit, David, do you think that journalists should be reluctant to take uh, defamation cases? Well, <laughs> interesting question. I think to defend your reputation, yes. And there's many examples. But let's go back to that. That's another issue. I'm not going down that particular road. No, Michael, you're being mischievous in the extreme in that one. But what about this whole thing about limits on the freedom of expression at the same time as others then are talking about introducing hate laws? Well, well laws? first of all, with regard to what Ali Salim said yesterday, which I, I was quite concerned about, he was saying that, that, he, that if, if anybody published the cartoons here, that, that he would try to get a blasphemy case taken against them. Now, under the Irish blasphemy law, for him to do that, the first thing that he has to do is show that the publication of the cartoons has caused outrage. So he has to either show outrage or encourage outrage. And the last thing that we need in the current atmosphere is for a senior respected Muslim cleric to be encouraging outrage as opposed to encouraging a more proportionate response to things that people disagree with. And that's one of the big dangers of our blasphemy law is that it incentivizes outrage instead of incentivizing well, reasonable discourse. this country gets outraged every other day about something or other. I mean, you say something politically incorrect, I gave various examples, and suddenly there's outrage all over the airwaves. We specialise in outrage. And this, again, is what worries me, that we introduce a set of laws to more or less replace blasphemy laws, okay, hatred, anti-hatred laws, and suddenly, look, they're outraged by, what's, by what a particular columnist has written, and next minute that columnist finds themselves getting charged, or brought before, like in Canada, a human rights commission. We've had people like Mark Stain and Ezra, and Ezra Levant accused of Islamophobia um, uh, and brought before these, I, I think it could have been to Quebec, I can't remember which, human rights commission, and had to fight a very long, hard fight to get their names cleared. 
But yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I, I think that we should err on the side of freedom of expression. Ideas should always be open to robust... Because, Michael, there was a time in this country that you wouldn't have allowed on the airwaves to express your belief that there is no God. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I mean, Was I, it ever that extreme? That an atheist couldn't go on the airwaves and say, I don't believe in God? I wouldn't think it was that extreme. There would have been outrage. And yeah, there would have been, been, yeah, for sure there would have been outrage. And it probably wouldn't have happened again for a very long time, David. Because producers and researchers and so on might have been scared to. But, I mean, look what's happening today again. I mean, people are so scared to open their mouths and say anything politically incorrect and you've got one of the few sitting here today who's willing to say politically incorrect things and you can see you know, how Twitter fills up with, with expressions of outrage just like that. Yeah, look, as I say, I think yeah, ideas should always be open to criticism and ridicule. I think that individuals should always be open to criticism and ridicule for their behaviour. I think that if you are inciting somebody to infringe on other people's human rights I think that's, that's where, where the limit is drawn and I, and I would draw it very restrictively. What do you think of that, Limit? Um, well, I mean, you know, what do we mean by human rights? Because there's all kinds of disagreements about human well, rights. Well, say the human uh, right to, to um, not be, uh, not of somebody encouraging cutting your head off because you say something about Muhammad. Well, obviously. Yeah. But I mean, like, I mean, like you're inciting violence there and we already have laws to cover that anyway. All right, we will leave it there with both of you. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. David Quinn, uh, columnist for the Irish Independent, also from the Own Institute, and Michael Nugent from Atheist Ireland. We will take the traffic now. It came in Burke. Keep up with the last word on todayfm.com on Twitter and on Facebook.